these objects with a purpose and with a condition or a, a, a reason for, how should I say this? Were they producing these objects to actually be viewed the way that we have as a thesis or were, are we just imagining this? The second is a key a question of human visual aspects. We can talk about human visual aspects in a number of ways, but when we talk about non-Western vision, I'm going to start by explaining a simple one, the fact that we look at objects under full light. We look at objects as they were presented to us in a direction that was presented to us. The aspect of direction is a purely Western aspect. If we look at this object, for example, in the question of light, I put it expressly in a place where it would be increasing in light. And as we increase in light, I'm gonna ask you to close one eye and to observe this object with a little bit of retreat. All of a sudden, these two elements become eyes. This becomes a mouth, an open mouth. And this aspect becomes a face that's protruding from the mouth. So in viewing this mask at different lights, this aspect is more and more visible or less visible. When we look at it in full light, it's difficult to extract the second imagery from this because our conditioning immediately brings our vision to the face. Our recognition is on the face. I've skipped ahead a little bit here because I wanted to introduce the fact that we have different notions of vision, but let's go forward with the stars or eyes. The stars or eyes is built on a thesis that vision in Western societies is something that is taught to us. We are regulated by the aspects of two and three dimension. We never discuss another reality that exists for others, but not for us, which is the fourth dimension, which we often refer to as a spirit or, or time, but it's an ambiguous dimension. However, non-Western cultures live with the, 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 the notion of three dimensions and the fourth dimension. The second dimension is something that is purely a construct of Western society. And yet our vision is regulated by the notion of two and three dimensions. When Anthony Forge went among the Avalan, he gave them canvases, 20 inch by 20 inch, 45, 50 centimeters by 50 centimeter flat canvases to paint their designs on in, in, so that he could understand them. What Anthony Forge failed to understand was that the actual medium itself, the flat board was something that was already new. So the medium was new for the people. And then the aspect of communicating what they were drawing was new for the people. The Abalam people are known and recognized for not having what's called exegesis. Exegesis is a willingness to share the meaning behind a design or a structure. They are a culture that invites a person to experience an issue, an item, an object, and grow from it on their own. They get from that object their own message. Now, all of this touches on the anthropological subject or the anthropological leg of my book, The Stars Are Eyes. If we stay on the anthropological aspect for a few moments, the, the reason that I used the Avalan in order to describe what we are seeing today is because by accident, as Punet mentioned, um, a friend of mine first imagined or saw something in another object, which was 
I'm going to just go forward a tiny bit here. This mask. This mask I came home with one day. And I think that people that know this class of mask in New Guinea, it's called a Parak mask. It represents a Parak bird. And that beak that protrudes is usually straight out. It, look, it often is called a mosquito mask. But in this case, I wonder if I can zoom it in a little bit. In this case, the mask has a broken beak, which was always enigmatic, which was always a question mark as to what was happening. It was only upon seeing it upside down as my friend did, that the door opened to understanding that there were many visual directions that were available to our sense of vision. For example, this is a delightful Ramu paddle terminal. It is Janus. So we have represent two double, re uh, double representation back to back. And this is the other side of it. So we have the same representation on the back side. However, facing the sky, we have a crocodile. A crocodile, which is a, a seminal part of the creation myth of the Ramu and the Yatmua people. Here is another example of a bird head that turns into a fish. So we have other examples in the world, as a matter of fact, that are even more surprising. If we take this May mask, May masks were first recognized in the field or written up in the field by Rene Gardi. Oops, I wonder if I can move this, like I'm missing a piece here. Okay, May masks were first recognized in the field or registered in the field by Rene Gardi in the 1950s in this manner. This is the way that Rene Gardi registered the mask in his books before being instructed that he had to look at it this way. And of course, every mask in the world, every May mask in the world, every May mask in every museum of the world hangs in this manner. There are further examples, oops, that's a little bit big, but still we can get the idea that we have a beautiful mask here, a gable mask, that presents and displays in two manners. So, while I chose to present the entire aspect of this idea through the Abalam, the reason that I did is because there was a large corpus of material that was able to serve as an example. I was able to build a body of material that would serve as visual proof of something called an ambigram. However, ambigrams are something that exist in graphics. They never existed visually. Only Anthony Forge, who had spent time, one of the first to have spent time among the Avalan, described the Avalan language because of their lack of explanation, as explained earlier, their lack of exegesis. He called their, their, their art a visual language, a visual language that one had to be conditioned and be part of the culture in order to understand. Just like a verbal language, if you come to it from the outside, you have no idea what's going on, but you know that there's communication going on in the language you don't understand. Visually, this is what Anthony Forge had come to as a summary for the art of Abelan. There was no explanation for the designs. There was no explanation for the meanings. What there was, was a visual language that one had to be, in his opinion, conditioned to experience. So I introduced to you the graphic aspect of an ambigram. Let's go to a slideshow and take you guys off full screen. And so the ambigram is a word that can be read in either direction. It's a graphic representation. It's a graphic build of a word. Here you have the word ambigram that can be read both ways, going left or going right. And visually, it turns out that we have 
designs that we could recognize if we allow ourselves to see it that are ambigraphic. And so here we have a Malagan mask from the Malagan ceremony. And if we turn it upside down, we see that we have a representation of his ancestral skull. As mentioned, the ambigram was a visual language, it becomes a visual language identified by Anthony Forge when regarding the art of Avalak. But what led to the discovery was a combination of the Parak mask that I showed you, which was accidentally viewed, or not accidentally, but uh, viewed in a new way by somebody who was familiar with tribal art, uh, but not an expert, not somebody who had been formatted yet. Somebody who appreciated tribal art, but I believe that we have a formatted vision, and this is the thesis on which my book is actually formed, that we have formatted vision. In order to discuss this formatted vision, the third part of the tripod for understanding this came from a, a, an extract of a story by Tobias Schneebaum. Tobias Schneebaum was an anthropologist who worked with the Azimat in the 1960s. And upon leaving for one of his trips in the mid 60s, he was asked by a New York psychiatrist to apply a test called the Lowenfeld mosaic test. I have this. Tobias Schneebaum. The Lowenfeld mosaic test is a test that's composed of various colored tiles, various shapes, and it comes in a package where on the tablet beside it, a viewer or player is invited to create a shape. Just like a Rocharge test, this allows a psychiatrist or psychologist according to the Lowenfeld mosaic method, um, a method that was used in 122 countries for evaluating verbal, oh, sorry, visual skills and visual capacities tied to those skills. So a doctor asked by Schneebaum to apply this test to the natives in New Guinea. On the way to New Guinea, on his Indonesian flight over, Tobias applied the test to a pilot, a, uh, an engineer aboard, and each one in turn took time but came up and designed a tree, a car, a, a, a sunshine with a house, something that was recognizable on a two-dimensional plane and put it in the tiles in the design that was recognizable. When Tobias got to Asmat, he asked the young man to do the same thing, to take the test. And the young man, after examining the tiles carefully, started to select different colors, different shapes, and to Tobias's surprise, made different piles out of them. This was not the intent of the test. So Tobias proceeded to apply the test to everyone in the group, in the culture, in the, in, the, in the tribe that he was with, and not one person developed a two-dimensional image. Each person developed a three-dimensional image. And so, as a summary, out of 122 countries that had been using this test for visual evaluation, this was not an appropriate method for evaluating the local manner of vision. Just on its own, that story stuck in my mind 10 years, 15 years ago when I read the book, and I asked myself how that was possible. This became eventually one of the legs of understanding that developed into the thesis that became my book, The Stars Arise. The second one is a question of human vision. Human vision is organized, as we were saying earlier, in dimensions. So we have no dimension. One dimension is a single line. The two-dimensional aspect. And then the three-dimensional aspect. These, once again, it's important to understand, are entirely Western constructs. We were introduced the idea of a two-dimensional object being a square, but nothing is two-dimensional in the world. 
Certainly nothing is two-dimensional in an organic world that composes the world of the Avalan and other first contact cultures. It is, it's important, there's, there's an interesting story actually, Finette and I were talking one time uh, in for preparation for this show, perhaps some of you viewers have seen this. It's a stage on which there's an audience and there's two spotlights coming down, and two groups of dancers. One group is dressed in blue, one group is dressed in red. And the narrator or the announcer comes out to the center of the stage and asks the audience, okay, audience, the, this music is gonna start and you've got two spotlights and I want the left side of the audience to count the red team as they jump in and out of the spotlight. And I want the right side of the audience to count the blue team when they jump in and out of the spotlight. At the end of it, we're gonna compare to see how many people have jumped in on the red team and how many people have jumped in on the right team, uh, on the blue team. And so the music starts and for two minutes, the teams are dancing and actively jumping in and out. Each side is jumping, individuals from each side are jumping into the spotlight. And obviously the audience is supposedly counting during that time. The music finishes and the announcer comes back and asks the left side of the audience for their number and they scream out a number, say 10. And the right side screams out a number, say 11, doesn't matter. The narrator then looks up at them and says, perfect, now who saw the giant penguin? And to their shock, and perhaps to the shock of some of you who have experienced this, because it was a, quite a famous trick your brain type of experiment on television, there was a huge six or two meter plush toy monkey or penguin or polar bear in different examples that walks across the stage while the dancers are performing their dance. And while everyone in the audience is counting the dancers jumping in and out of the spotlights, nobody sees the bear or nobody sees the penguin. This is a two meter tall plush toy that walks across the middle of the scene. He stops in the middle of the scene. He looks at the audience, turns around and continues walking. Not one person in an audience of dozens of people see him. We are conditioned to see what we've been taught to see. When someone came to Anthony Forge, or when somebody came to Dr. Richard Scaglian, or when somebody came to Dr. Brigitte Hauser, Schaublin, or Don Tuzin, and said, Donald Tuzin, sorry, all anthropologists of early days, when they said, here is a yam mask, we accepted that it was a yam mask. We try to understand what a yam mask is used for, what they believe the yam mask to be, uh, how it's used, when it's used, et cetera, et cetera. And we will shortly come to that just to, just to have a little sur uh, overview of it. But the idea that it was presented as a yam mask is integral. There is a yam mask and nobody questioned that it was a yam mask. Well, I wanna tell you folks, this is the actual mask that fell over in my gallery and showed me that there was something going on in the world. This was three years after my girlfriend at the time had noticed the Parak mask being upside down. This was two years after having found the little Ramu terminal that I showed you upside down because there are very few objects, surprisingly, in other cultures that were recognized as being visually ambidextrous. This yam mask, however, is strikingly visually ambidextrous. And it supports many other yam masks that we find. Sorry. That have the same visual power when presented upside down. So what is a yam mask? Uh, well, this says the Avalanche, so let's go back to viewing full screen. Oops. Sorry, folks. Just got a couple of seconds here. All right. 
what is a yam mask? And who do they, who are they used by? Because I, I want to spend a few minutes discussing yam mask in particular with a clear separation as to whether or not the anthropology applies or not. What's important in my book is that I want to present graphic evidence. The simple matter is that we will never know what or if this was believed, used, or produced by the Avalan people. We can only see the result and imagine what might have been upstream. I did, as Hinet mentioned, manage to connect, very, very grateful to have managed to connect with Dr. Richard Skagerin, who is one of the earliest still living anthropologists to have worked with the Avalan. 30 or 40 years among them, an Avalan father spoke the language and was there at a, as an, at an instrumental time when the window upon the culture was still open. And this is an important aspect. The window on the culture of the Avalan was opened from, well, let's, let's go briefly. 1913, George Thirdwald discovers the Avalan as he's walking through Papua New Guinea. No further contact with the Avalan until Second World War when you have the Japanese that come in and occupy part of the territory, no further contact with the Avalan. As of the Second World War, we begin to have sporadic contact. We have Gardi that comes in, we have Forge that comes in, we have then this Dr. Skaglian that comes in, and followed by Donald Tuzin, Brigitte Hauser, uh, Ludwig Kutai, uh, other anthropologists, uh, uh, Noah McGuigan, who worked in the field with them. But following Dr. Skaglian and, and Donald Tuzin, who really were there at the, the turn of the culture, in 1984 or 87, I apologize for the date, uh, but in 1984, I believe it was, on, on a famous Sunday morning, the Avalan supposedly burned down the tambourine, these, these, these carambos, these magnificent houses, and gave away their secrets to the world, to women and the uninitiated. Um, it was called The Death of the Cassowary. And Donald Tuzin wrote a book about it because apparently, supposedly, that was a turning point where the Avalanche culture no longer practiced the essential aspects of their culture. For example, pigs were no longer allowed to roam in Avalanche villages after that, or didn't roam in Avalanche villages after that. This was documented by Ludwig Kutai, who in, in the communication with Brigitte Hauser, apparently, uh, Dr. Hauser said that when he visited in the early 80s, there were no longer, the, the, the gardens were down in the villages, the pigs were no longer there for ceremonies, and that even though the houses remained, they remained there mostly. If I recall that he said this part, I, I should have ended the quotation earlier, but, uh, but they remained basically for modern purposes. The, so, so the Avalan culture, we had vision on it between 1967 and 1924, a short period of time where initiations were being practiced, ceremonies were being practiced. And the very simple fact of it is that none of our anthropologists, none of our Western uh, interlopers here were initiated into men's society of secrets. So. I expand on this thesis in my book uh, with, with the stages of initiation and one stage in particular where there is a possibility that this whole notion of the world upside down gets introduced. Uh, but I'm not going to cover that. What I'm going to cover is most is to is cover the yams and the avalanche for a couple of moments. The avalanche are renowned for their large houses, as I was mentioning earlier, 30 meters tall these houses, fantastic, fantastic houses. These are also the most geometric objects among the Avalon culture. These large panels are the largest flat surfaces that are used by the Avalon. So we see this in our two-dimensional view as a painting. It is a two-dimensional painting. It has no depth to it, so it's not a three-dimensional thing, but this is again Western vision. Non-Western vision invites us to understand that there is much meaning beyond it. There is a fourth dimension, 
which is ancestral, spiritual, and the meaning of this painting, it is said, because I can't speak for the Abilam, transports the Abilam into their own voyage of connection with it. It's an object that elicits. It's not an object that is admired per se. It's an object that elicits. They have a connection to it. These houses tower 30 meters above the ceremonial ground of the village, which is called the Ame. And in the Ame are presented the ceremonies of the Abalam and especially the Yam. So the Abalam grow two types of Yam. And the Yam are central to the Abalam's culture and the system of belief. The long yams are not meant for eating. They are ceremonial. They represent deceased ancestors. And their cultivation regulates much of Abalam life because the culture and the system of belief is such that when the ancestral yams are growing for the six month growing season, they require cool energy. Therefore, during that six month period, there are no arguments. There are no wars. There are no disagreements. There's no honking your horn metaphorically or arguing with your neighbor metaphorically. There is no procreation. There is no hot activity. No activities that engage energy in a hot manner during six months growing period. Imagine that, 40 hamlets, 40 villages are a complete standstill while the young, long yams are growing. Once they grow and there is a harvest season, or rather a harvest, I should say, there is then the ceremonial season. And obviously one can imagine that this is the system, the, the, the season in which there is everything that was not during the hot period now happening. War, arguments, everything that was saved up, all the arguments you want to have with your neighbor, they're saved up and they come out at that time. It regulates Abalam life in an interesting way because all the babies are also born at the same period of the year. The, the cultivation, the harvest is yielding at the same time as the babies are born. So there is food around at the same time. And it's at that time that ceremonially yams play a big role as well. They're displayed in the Ame and <clears throat> excuse me, are dressed with masks that are called yam masks. We all know of yam masks. Yam masks adorn yams in the houses in the manner seen here. One can question, however, if the direction that we've been looking at yam masks is the correct direction. And again, to say correct or incorrect is not right. The fact is that this art displays in a ambidextrous way. So there is no right way or wrong way. The interesting thing is that there is this ambidextrous aspect to this design and it's unique to this form of art. It's very, very rare in Western art. Having looked for, for many examples in Western art, I've found some caricatures, I've found some and I'm happy to, to show them as we were running out of time a little bit. I'm happy to show them to people privately, but I wanted to show this picture of a yam mask because of, of yam masks in the house rather, because here they're shown as they are presented to us, the uninitiated. We stand among, sorry, the women and children in this culture as being the uninitiated. It's important, however, to know that there's a reason that women are held outside of society or, or, or um, of, of Abalam culture, of, of Abalam secret society. And it's a good reason. The fact is that Abalam people believe that women are born with a natural power, spiritual, supernatural power that men can only achieve through ceremony. That's why if the women were allowed into the men's house, they're power would be such that it would be unequal. The ceremonies of men serve to bring them up 
to the equality of the standard that they consider women to have. I think that's cool. The other thing that's cool is that the Abalam believe that the stars are composed of the bones of the ancestors that created the earth. They are the eyes of the ancestors that created the earth. And therefore, if we escape our vision being so conditioned and so willing to accept how things were introduced to us and, and take a moment to step outside of the visual box, we have to understand that these objects were produced for spirits and spirits are non-linear. Our vision is linear. Our vision is Cartesian. Non-Western vision is non-linear. It is non-Cartesian. It is actually led and regulated just like ours is by two and three dimensional thought. It is led and regulated by spiritual dimensions and spirits inhabit everywhere, space everywhere. There is no direction to them. Aspects like Time, as I was saying before, are another example of this. Uh, Non-Western cultures are intimately familiar with seasons and the, and the passage of time, but in no way are they familiar with our calendar and our notion of hours, minutes, days, and, and months, and so forth. So to in, in, infuse our vision or our way, our conditioned manners, whether they be visual, or intellectual on others, especially non-Western, it equals a not understanding, a mistranslation of the events that are being proposed to us. So here we have faces that actually resemble, in, even in our vision, ancestral faces, ancestral skulls, more so than in this direction. And these represent ancestral skulls. So it kind of makes sense that they are ancestral skulls. Now, does it make sense to the Avalon? I don't know. And I don't pretend to know. And I will never know. And we will never know. I think we've gone up the river as far as possible in asking the anthropologists of the field that were there in the day about their experience. And both Dr. Skaglian and Christian Coiffier confirmed that they had had this experience in the field. Does it not look a little bit more like a skull? Then we have Baba masks. Just to finish quickly, because we are running out of time. Uh, how are you people doing? Okay. Um, Baba mask. This is a Baba mask being danced in the field. Baba is the only other world spirit who is allowed in the ceremonial ground, the Ame. He is a representative of the other world coming from the Wale, the pools, and he is a spirit of the pools. He comes in as an opponent, always needs to be repelled by the initiates. So whenever he is presented in the Ame, in the ceremonial ground, First, he always faces east. He is always at dusk or at dawn. He's never in full light. And this is one being danced in the field in full regalia. This is one, the same one, being seen from the angle that I propose, where the, in the ancestors inhabit the stars and therefore seen from above we have this representation here is another with a representation of a stylized pig the pig being the ultimate bridge between man and spirit in avalan cosmology spirits don't live in statues and masks insofar as the avalan culture is written about. Again, I'm not an anthropologist. I don't pretend to know. I've read that spirits do not inhabit the, cult, the, 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 the figures that inhabit the ceremonial house. It's when pigs are burned 
and their skin is seared and their hide is cut that they scream and this scream is what invites the spirits to come and inhabit the vessels that we call the sculptures and masks i don't know to me this looks with the stylized ears and the stylized shape of the face and the stylized screaming mouth we have a humanoid and we have a pig-like projection here upside down, which is a complete link to the other world. So the, the iconography, physically, the visual iconography matches up with the cultural iconography. The pig is the representative to the, to the spirit of the other world and he serves in ceremony. And who is he applying here? He is applying himself or he is displaying himself to the ancestors in the sky. Now, I want to take a moment to discuss the ability and the incredible aspect of these Baba masks, which were literally magical and kaleidoscopic in the jungle. Imagine this, in the jungle when no television has ever existed, no, no contact with the Western world has ever existed, and a being like this comes out. A being like this comes out in the MA, and this construct, this spirit rather, has a dual presentation, a dual display. Imagine having now the ability to see this. It must have been pure magic to the people that were visualizing it. Here we have a Baba mask then, and here we have a visual from the sky. Another and another. And I, I, you know, there, there are many, many um, hypotheticals that can be brought out because when you put these together, as I have in my book, if you look at this image here, uh, you, you begin to see that they, they have a certain similarity. They, you begin to, to draw.